Good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the 105th uh, Farm Show. And thank you for joining our Cultivating Tomorrow panel series. Today's panel is centered around cultivating innovation through research. Uh, my name is Fred Strathmire, Jr. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Plant Industry and Consumer Protection, and I will be uh, facilitating today's conversation. Uh, as we're going, uh, if you have questions, uh, please ask uh, through Facebook, and we'll uh, attempt to answer those uh, as we go in the uh, in the uh, series here. So joining us today are researchers funded uh, by the Department of Agriculture who are finding solutions to challenges both farmers and consumers experience every day. We are joined by Agriculture Secretary Russell Redding, by Mr. Jeff Moyer, the Chief Executive Officer at Rodale Institute, Dr. Tom Baker, University Distinguished Professor of Entomology and Chemical uh, Ecology, Huck Institute of Life Sciences, Department of Entomology, Penn State University. Dr. Matthew Helmus, Assistant Professor, Temple University, the Department of Biology. Dr. Suresh Kuchipudi, uh, Clinical Professor and Head of Microbiology, Associate Director at, uh, at the Animal Diagnostic Lab. Uh, Dr. Deepankar Tiwari, Director of the Pennsylvania Veterinary uh, Laboratory at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and Dr. Tom Parsons, Professor of Swine Production Medicine, University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Starting today's discussion with a few opening remarks is, Secret is Secretary Redding, our 26th Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Secretary of Agriculture. Secretary Redding. Hey, good thank morning. you, Fred. Uh, yeah, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you, and thank you all for joining us for this virtual farm show. Uh, as, as we all know, um, you know we're, we're in this great experiment with uh, presenting uh, a million square feet of activity, uh, but we thought it was appropriate uh, this year as we put together this panel uh, series is to begin with research because at the end of the day, you know the progress that we have made in agriculture. Uh, is because of the, uh, the research and the innovation that's taken place uh, over the years. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we selected uh, our theme of cultivating tomorrow uh, to express the aspiration that each of us feels for uh, the day when we regain our freedoms uh, of daily life and traditions. But it's also an expression of hope uh, and the actions required to achieve it. Uh, and one of those critical actions uh, is uh, the importance of research and, and cultivating that innovation that we speak of. Uh, we've got to solve the problems. We've got to spark solutions uh, to the challenges that farmers and consumers uh, experience every day. And research uh, is a tool for building that knowledge and facilitating uh, learning. It helps us identify the problems and better understand the issues of Pennsylvania uh, and Pennsylvanians are, are confronting. Uh, and we'll hear from each of you today, uh, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to to have you with us. While each of you are uh, uh, different in, in your disciplines, uh, there's a common denominator uh, among all of the research, and that is helping Pennsylvania agriculture stay profitable, keep our citizens safe, keep the animal uh, animals, and, and certainly our food system safe. So. Uh, that is a story we wanted to share as part of this uh, farm show and, and felt it was an important way to begin the, the panel series. So I'm excited to join you. Thank you all for the partnership with the Department of Agriculture and look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Redding. As uh, Secretary Redding stated, research is continuing to provide solutions to challenges both farmers and consumers experience every day. Dr. Baker, we're going to start with you today. Can you tell us uh, more about your forward fly research and how these pests impact Pennsylvania mushroom farmers? Okay, so am I unmuted now? Yes, I'm unmuted. Hello. You're good. 
I'm good, thank you. I know that you can't see me. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. And thank you, uh, Secretary Redding, also for having me um, come here to tell you something about the mushroom forward fly situation and much mushroom cultivation. Well, a few years ago, we became aware that the mushroom farmers uh, in, um, around Philadelphia, we're experiencing uh, really bad problems with the mushroom forward fly. And also the neighborhoods around the mushroom farms were experiencing um, severe invasions of their homes with the mushroom flies. So we, with the help of the PDA and the USDA funding, we uh, managed to pinpoint after a couple of years, the, the pinpoint the problem that uh, the Flies were uh, emerging from the mushroom houses by the billions and billions, and we had to take care of the problem of the flies on the mushroom farms. And our mushroom forward fly research team of Nina Jenkins, Dr. Nina Jenkins, and Dr. Michael Wolfen, and myself developed a um, scheme in 2018 and 19 to try to take care of the forward flies on the mushroom farms. And this, since the theme of this um, gathering is innovation um, in agriculture, I have to say that the in innovation uh, in this uh, system was to use an eaves tubes technology to try to get the flies um, poisoned as they try to leave the mushroom growing rooms in the windows, uh, the small mushroom growing rooms, and also as they try to re-enter these windows. And this technique was enacted um, at first in malaria mosquitoes by Nina Jenkins and um, Matt Thomas, and we employed it. And Mike Wolfen got this working at the end of 2020 on Shiraki Farms um, in, the, in the Lincoln University area, Upper Oxford Township. And he managed, and the um, Jamie Shiraki, who cooperated uh, beautifully with this scheme, they were able to reduce the number of flies in the 34 room building. All 34 rooms have mushrooms growing in them managed to reduce the flies by starting with like 1 million dead flies that they were able to uh, collect below these windows treated with this um, uh, essential oil product from 1 million per room then in uh, early October to about 700,000 per room. And by December, uh, they uh, were able to reduce it to an average of less than 100 per room. And this was the diligence of the workers at the farm and uh, Jamie Shiraki, uh, the attention they took. So this is a proof of concept, I have to stress. Even though it's a, and the, the Turner's Pond uh, residents are expressing, they showed a drop in mushroom uh, forehead flies in their homes, many of them, as the success of this Eves tube technology took off. It's a proof of concept, and Michael Wolfen is trying to uh, extend this um, technology to more mushroom farms in 2021. And we are we have received some more funding from the PDA, which we're very grateful for, to help in this uh, process. So uh, thank you, Fred. I'm sorry you can't see me, and um, <laughs> at least you could hear me, I think. Thank you, Dr. Baker. And uh, for what it's worth, I've, I've actually been able to see you the whole time. Oh. So uh, again, thank you. And uh, on a personal note, uh, thank you for what you're doing down there. As you know, I've tried to make sure that uh, we've stayed on top of this at PDA, and we certainly support the, the work that you and the other researchers are doing there. So Dr. Kuchipudi, uh, animal and human often go hand in hand. Uh, can you explain how your research is critical for both animal and human health? Dr. Kuchipudi? 
Yeah, thank you, Deputy Secretary uh, Streckmeyer, um, and good morning to you all. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Secretary Redding for inviting me to this panel. Um, so the, uh, the first point I wanted to make is that we are in this unprecedented global pandemic, um, and, and the reason we are meeting virtually is because of we are in the middle of this pandemic. So uh, infectious disease continue to be a major threat and have always been uh, to both animal health and human health. So the research I do at Penn State uh, um, is centered around infectious diseases, particularly um, the research that we do fits into this theme called One Health, which recognizes that animal health, human health, and environmental health are, are inseparable and they're intimately connected to each other. So um, a major focus of my research is to study emerging infectious diseases. Uh, so the, um, to, uh, to highlight, the fact that um, a majority of the emerging infectious diseases, nearly 80% of them uh, have zoonotic potential. Uh, so which means that uh, there is uh, implications to both animal health and human health. So um, it is important that um, while the primary objective of my research uh, uh, that we work in partnership with the PDA and other stakeholders is to protect animal agriculture, but the knowledge and the tools that we develop in the process are um, highly relevant and in many cases applicable to uh, human health. And I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight a couple of key um, research progresses that we made uh, working in partnership with PDA. As some of you may remember, we have had some animal health um, 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 emerging diseases in, in Pennsylvania over the past couple of days. One of them was um, uh, foul coryza, which continues to be a, a problem. And uh, this is a disease that we do not normally expect uh, in a place like Pennsylvania. And then uh, suddenly we started seeing um, um, outbreaks of the disease. And uh, at the time, uh, we do not have a rapid method to detect this uh, disease. And we are depending on um, sending samples out to an external lab in other states. So with the partnership with PDA and the funding support, we were able to develop a rapid molecular diagnostic test, um, which is now uh, allowing us to uh, detect the disease very quickly um, in a matter of hours, as opposed to a matter of days in the past. Um, and now we are uh, better prepared to, uh, to not only detect um, the, the spread of this disease and also to be uh, uh, better um, uh, in a position to better control the disease. And um, this is the, the first uh, ever molecular detection test for this disease in the country. So we are, we are really pleased that we in Pennsylvania are leading this effort in protecting our animal agriculture. And the second example I wanted to highlight is um, in, in roughly around December 2019, we have had um, a, a problem in, in pigs uh, caused by a disease that was um, killing pigs. And we quickly understood that the disease is a bacterial disease that um, traced back to a strain that was originally found in China. It's called Strep Zoo. Uh, again, same story. Um, there is no rapid test for this disease. And we were very quickly, and in, in fact, this happened over Christmas, and we developed an assay, uh, again, uh, for the first time in the country that is now also able to selectively detect the virulent version of this bacterium. So these are two examples uh, among many other things that we uh, we continue to do in protecting animal agriculture. And uh, uh, other point I wanted to make in terms of innovation is uh, traditionally approach to animal disease and animal health protection has always been reactive. So we wait for a problem to happen and then we, we try to research the problem, see what can be done. And in the process, we lose valuable time um, because the disease causes immense losses to our animal agriculture. So the, the approach that we take um, now um, is to be proactive. And, and this is only possible because of the excellent partnerships that we built with PDA and all the stakeholders in the state and also the federal government um, is to be proactive and, and really investigate what could be a potential problem that might emerge and what may be the impact to animal agriculture. So this is now putting us in a position where we could develop proactively tools and mitigation strategies that can uh, um, that can help us to protect animal agriculture if ever these problems were to be um, what to threaten our animal agriculture. Uh, and and the last point I wanted to make um, uh, is that uh, uh, even SARS coronavirus 2, which is causing the COVID-19 pandemic, currently it is not considered or at least not believed to be a threat to animal agriculture. 
But rather than waiting for uh, a problem that may happen, we also have been very proactively researching this, uh, this uh, um, virus and what could be uh, a possible impact to our animal agriculture to be more specific uh, to poultry, pigs and cattle. So we are uh, we have also developed um, tools to to detect if ever these virus this virus what to um, infect our our animal um, uh, livestock species, and this is a research that is being done in partnership with PDA and and the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture and the funding support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuchipudi. Um, and I just want to remind our listeners that uh, if you have questions to Go to Facebook and uh, ask your questions, and we'll see if we can answer them. At this time, uh, we're going to move to Dr. Helmus uh, on spotted lanternfly. Uh, we know it as an invasive species. Uh, we are fortunate uh, that I would say that uh, many of our citizens are now familiar after five years of uh, uh, dealing with this uh, pest, this invasive, uh, that uh, they are aware of it. But can you tell us more about the travel patterns of these pests and why it's important to track their movements? Dr. Helmus. Sure, thanks so much for that, uh, Deputy Staff Meyer. And thank you, uh, Secretary Redding, for, for inviting me to this. Um, so you're right, spotted land flies invasive species. It was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014. And only about six years, it's actually spread to seven other states um, here in the mid-Atlantic and then uh, most recently into Ohio. Um, and so, I know that most of us do know about spotted lanternfly, but for those of us who don't, it's a plant hopper. Um, it sucks a sap of about 100 or more different species, um, including some really important timber species and landscaping species like walnut and maple, fruit trees like apple and grapes as well. Um, and the, the Pennsylvania vineyards that have been uh, infested by lanternfly, uh, for example, have seen um, increased costs, um, uh, decreased yield um, and much more use of pesticides. And so it's a really damaging agricultural pest. Um, and several researchers, including um, my lab at Temple University in Philadelphia, are working hard to try and figure out the solutions. And we're working on different projects with, um, figuring out how to control the spotted lanternfly so that it doesn't do more damage as it spreads. And so my lab was funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture to model the spread of the pest. Think about spotted lanternfly as um, moving, uh, as spreading in two different ways. And first, spotted lanternfly moves naturally. They, they fly. And you can think about that spread as being like you drop a stone in, in a lake and you have sort of a, a spread pattern, a, a diffusive spread pattern that occurs. But then the second way that spotted lanternfly will actually move or travel is inadvertently through humans, where if you have someone who accidentally moves spotted lanternfly eggs or spotted lanternfly adults into uh, a new area, then you can think about sort of that spread pattern occurring naturally. But then you have these satellite populations popping up in different locations. And then that spread pattern, that natural dispersal starts to occur. And so what we're trying to do is model where those new satellite populations might pop up. Because then if we're able to forecast and identify where those spread populations might pop up, then that allows PDA, USDA, the farmers and the public to figure out that, okay, well, that's an area where it's likely to, 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 to travel there. Then we can put our resources, tamp down that population, and then we're not overwhelming our resources by fighting spotted lanternfly both in the central area where it's spreading and also in these new satellite populations. And by slowing that spread, that gives researchers more time to come up with these solutions so that spotted lanternfly then does less damage um, uh, as we're trying to then figure out solutions. Because if we have more time to figure out those solutions for control, then we can cause less damage in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Helmus, and thanks for all the work that you and your colleagues are doing at Temple. Um, at this time, we're going to move to Dr. Parsons. Um, the, the University of Pennsylvania New Bolton Center is home to a swine and peach research center. Uh, Dr. Parsons, I'm sure that a lot of people, including myself, were not much aware of uh, the New Bolton Center. Uh, so can you tell us more about the center and the research that you're working on? Sure. Uh, good morning, and uh, Fred and Russell and the rest of the organizers, thank you so much for the opportunity to visit uh, today about the Swine Center and um, a little bit about what we do uh, at New Bolton Center with regard to um, um, 
helping the swine industry. And so the Swine Center is really the kind of the physical home to our swine program, uh, which includes myself, uh, Dr. Megan Peart, and, and Dr. Gary Althaus. Um, however, really, our efforts uh, certainly uh, strive to go beyond the walls of, of the center. And really what we have worked on trying to do is establish both national and international reputations in our areas of research, and then bring that expertise back to uh, bear on the Commonwealth and hopefully providing a competitive advantage to Pennsylvania swine farmers. And what I'd like to do today is really just share with you uh, a few vignettes of the research that we've done um, to basically try to see how we can drive innovation uh, in the swine industry through the application of technology. Uh, and I think it's interesting just to note that all these technologies we've worked with at one time were extremely expensive and cost prohibitive in agriculture, but they've uh, found mass markets usually within some human application. And that has allowed the technology of the, uh, the cost of the technology to uh, come down to a place where we can afford to use it in, in agriculture. Uh, and the other point I'd make is that uh, all these uh, research projects have been supported at one point uh, by the PGA, by the PDA, or um, more recently by the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Center for um, Livestock and Poultry Excellence. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about was Dr. Pearden's project, uh, which involves the um, Pennsylvania Swine Disease Control and Eradication Program. So this is an instance where we've been able to use GPS mapping to identify all of the uh, swine farms in the state and then collect uh, meta information on those farms, including details about disease status that allows us then to as an industry um, to take on and help manage uh, swine diseases. Uh, and certainly that, that, that has been helpful because there are many diseases in some cases, um, you need to have this bigger view to be able to, uh, to make progress on, on controlling that disease. Another example I wanted to talk about was work that Dr. Althaus is initiating, initiating related to the application of telemedicine. And so um, as it's been acknowledged, uh, we're all here virtually due to the pandemic, and certainly that has driven uh, video conferencing technology in uh, ways I think we would have never imagined. And so now uh, we're interested in seeing if we can use that, um, those advances to help us um, be able to uh, reach uh, farmers with this telemedicine approach. And obviously it allows us to get expertise to the farms in ways we wouldn't be able to do that before, and also um, may help with some concerns about biosecurity uh, going forward. Um, the last couple of things I wanted to share with you then were related to uh, work that, that my group has, has been focused on. And the first one would have been the application of uh, so-called wearable devices. I think uh, you would commonly know them as Fitbits. Um, their technical name is triaxle accelerometer, accelerometers. And we've been using those to try to study the behavior of animals. In particular, uh, what I want to talk to you about is an effort we have ongoing to look at boars and to uh, try to capture sickness behavior. So uh, the question is, can we go ahead and find early uh, signals that might uh, portray to us that a, a boar is, is sick, is coming down with a disease? And so we, we're looking to see if we can see that by putting this wearable device, this Fitbit on them, and essentially monitoring their activity. And, of course, why this is important with respect to boar studs um, is that the way the swine industry is organized today, we have uh, a small number of, of central locations where boars are located uh, that semen is distributed uh, to across the country. And so if we have a sick boar who's potentially transmitting disease through a semen, there's just uh, incredible potential to disseminate that disease. And in some cases, some of these viral diseases, the ones that we worry the most about, things like African swine fever, sometimes will be um, passed in the body fluids before they show um, other classical clinical signs. So we want to see if we can use behavior to go ahead and uh, uh, detect those cases uh, sooner rather than later. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was the use of uh, so-called time of flight cameras to uh, look at lameness in, in, in pigs, particularly in sows. And so I think many of you now have some type of facial recognition uh, device either on your phone or your laptop. Well, that's using this technology where what it does is it creates a three-dimensional map of, of your face and then uses features from that to identify you. Well, this technology, again, which is, is now uh, very affordable, uh, allows us to essentially image the surface of the back of a sow 
And then we can watch that moving in space with a movie. So seeing how that changes um, and looking to see if we can pick up um, uh, subtle changes in, in gait abnormality. And what we're doing is coupling that with machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to see if uh, there might be information in these images that even the human eye might not notice to see if we can detect lameness at, at, at a very early stage. Because again, um, it's a huge uh, problem within the industry, both uh, causing negative impact on productivity and welfare. So anyways, um, that's just a, a really rapid tour of some of the ways we've been using technology uh, to drive in innovation uh, through research in the swine industry. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. Uh, very interesting, uh, all the projects that you all are working on. And again, I remind our viewers that if you have questions that you can go to Facebook to uh, ask those questions uh, going forward. Um, Secretary Redding, uh, it seems like an obvious question, but uh, why is funding research important? And then how does research aid the department in fulfilling its mission? Yeah, thank you, Fred. I, I think you just answered the question in the brief overviews. Uh, you know, as I listen you know, to each of the uh, researchers, you know, these are issues that, of course, are important and part of the domain of agriculture, but quite frankly, they are the domain of society, right? They're the issues of concern, whether it's on the health, uh, uh, animal health and welfare uh, concerns, our food supply, the quality of life, it's the plant health and so forth. But uh, I, I think this, this panel sort of makes the point that uh, you know, funding of research, you, you really are not going to have, you know, progress in society without research. Uh, research is an investment in, in tomorrow in so many ways. What I particularly like about the public side of this, uh, your research is important from all, all sides, you know, certainly uh, public and private interests. But uh, what I like in, in particularly that we can participate is the public uh, is a stakeholder in this research, right? We're not, we're not doing this simply because the, they are concerned to the Department of Agriculture. We're looking at these issues because they are concerned to the Commonwealth and the citizens and industries that are here. Uh, so having the, uh, the public support research, identifying the problems, funding it, looking at the outcomes, it's the system side of our work, right? Uh, making these connections that are really critical. So we can't fulfill the mission of the department, you know, whether that's on the food security or conservation, uh, the plant health, animal health, uh, without the, the foundational work of science without the foundational work of researchers and the institutions we have here in Pennsylvania. We'll commit uh, you know, $2 million, over, over $2 million this year to research. You've heard in the last few minutes a sampling of the concerns. And to me, uh, we do a lot of different things in this department, but being able to partner with uh, researchers, the best minds in Pennsylvania, that are looking at both the sustainability and viability of agriculture, uh, but also doing that with the public interest and making sure that we're really solving those issues that are important today, uh, but they also help us cultivate tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary Redding, uh, much appreciated. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, Mr. Moyer. Uh, Rodale's research focuses on three primary areas of growth, uh, growing organic agriculture, mitigating and, uh, and adapting climate change, and solving food insecurity by growing nutrient-dense foods. Would you share more with us about your organic farming systems trials and how this research is contributing to Rodale's three areas of growth? Mr. Moore? Well, first, let me say uh, thank you, Secretary Redding, for inviting me, uh, Sec uh, Deputy Secretary Strathmeyer, and to my fellow panelists. A real pleasure to be with you all this morning. Some folks may not know too much about who Rodale Institute is. We are a publicly funded nonprofit sitting primarily our world headquarters is in Berks County, Pennsylvania, where we work uh, in the area of organic and regenerative agriculture, specifically focusing in on the links between soil health, human health, 
and planetary health. It's an exciting field of opportunity for us as we look both at basic and applied research across a broad spectrum of topics. I'll focus in on just a few of them here today to give the listeners a little taste of what we're doing uh, to your uh, question, Deputy Secretary, uh, focusing in on the, the growth of organic agriculture, the impacts on mitigating climate change, and also nutrient-dense food. First, when you look at organic agriculture, you wonder why would we be working in this area? Pennsylvania, along with the rest of the nation, uh, purchases about, any, depending on the food group, anywhere from 6% to 14% of their food is produced and grown organically. Yet in Pennsylvania, we only have about 1% of our farmland that is organic. So from an economic standpoint, that means that the majority of the organic products that are consumed by our state's population are produced someplace else. So we worked uh, dil diligently to change that uh, and to bring Pennsylvania farmers to that marketplace so they can take advantage of the consumer demand that is growing specifically in uh, a time of health impacts like we're seeing with COVID when people make choices on their food product based on the impact on their health and organic consumption is growing rapidly and we need our state to be able to take advantage of that. We also look at the impacts on climate change and whether we agree as individuals uh, on how we got to a situation where the climate is changing or whether we even agree with the concepts of climate change all of us as farmers recognize that weather patterns are shifting and changing, and we have to make allowances for that and accommodate that and mitigate our production strategies to be able to take advantage of that. We know that uh, agriculture can be part of the problem or part of the solution when it comes to climate change, and we focus our energy on solutions here at Rodale Institute in partnership with, of course, our land-grant universities, many of the institutions that are represented on this panel, as well as uh, land-grant universities across the nation, looking specifically at the links with carbon. We know that our uh, production systems can release carbon into the atmosphere or we can trap carbon in the soil. So we're uh, looking at the science of that, and specifically Dr. Yi Chao Roy, a soil microbiologist here at Rodale Institute, is looking at the soil's ability to trap and hold carbon at greater depths, moving it down into the soil profile where we can hold it for decades, if not uh, centuries. Uh, at the same time, uh, Dr. Gladys Zanotti is looking at other work focusing in on human health, targeting in, in particular uh, production strategies impact on not just on soil health, but how the health of the soil translates into human health. Uh, a simple piece of information that might, people might find interesting is a compound that's found in our soil called ergothionine. Ergothionine is an amino acid that is produced by certain mushrooms, but primarily produced by soil funguses. And we wonder why would that be important to us as humans? Well, we've known about ergothionine for about 100 years, but we didn't really know what it did or how it was produced. Uh, it turns out that this amino acid has a strong impact on neurological disorders, things like autism, attention deficit disorder, or even Alzheimer's can be mitigated by this amino acid ergothionine. What we've seen is that ergothionine in our soils has been dropping at a rate of about 1% a year. So over the last 50 years, we've lost half of the ergothionine in our diet. Different production systems, primarily focusing in on uh, regenerative organic systems, we can get the soils to produce more ergothionine, therefore having huge impacts on our human health. So by looking at these nutrients, uh, both uh, min vitamins, minerals, as well as uh, phytonutrients and micronutrients, we're beginning to use technology now to move from looking at a few hundred uh, compounds found in our soils and in our foods to tens of thousands using molecular mapping. So there's a lot of exciting technology uh, that's leading us to change as farmers the way we produce food so we can supply better 
healthier products to our consuming public. Thank you, Deputy Strathmore. Thank you, Mr. Moyer. Again, very interesting. And, and as uh, you said, many people are not uh, aware of Rodale. And so thank you for that. Um, Dr. Tawari, um, you have been uh, working on chronic wasting disease uh, research. Um, first of all, what is chronic wasting disease and how will your research benefit the Commonwealth's deer farmers? Thank you, Deputy uh, Secretary Fred uh, Strathmeyer, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Redding, for inviting me to this uh, uh, learned panel. Uh, greetings to all the members who have joined us this morning. Uh, chronic wasting disease is a disease of uh, deer. It's in the same group of uh, uh, prion mediated disease as is uh, known to cause uh, mad cow disease with the only difference that this disease, uh, chronic wasting disease, does not cause disease in humans. So it's a transmissible disease in uh, deer uh, that causes the spongiform encephalopathy and death of the infected animals. Our official surveillance methods currently rely on uh, laborious uh, methods that take time to conduct in the laboratories to diagnose the disease and infection. Uh, and they rely uh, pretty much on techniques that have been worked on through years of work and, and they're called immunohistic mystery and ELISA. Because it takes time to diagnose these diseases and they're diagnosed at the point of death of animals, uh, uh, the samples are collected when the animal dies. So obviously there would be interest in new generation of tests that can rely on detecting the disease in anti-mortem situations where we can detect them in live animals. So our laboratory that is a tier one national animal health laboratory in the country, uh, it's a premier laboratory uh, here at Pennsylvania Veterinary Laboratory in Harrisburg, which relies on uh, newer methods of detection for diseases that Dr. Kuchipudi also pointed out. And it's done in partnership with the private and uh, th this new test development is being done in uh, partnership with private lab uh, and our um, other university laboratory at, uh, at uh, New Bolton Center. And in conjunction with the public, uh, public meaning the deer farmers who are contributing to the samples for the test development. The goal with that new test, which is called RT Quick, is to develop a test that would be uh, used on live animals, uh, where we can collect the samples uh, from, uh, from these animals. It could be feces of the animals. It could be uh, the biopsy samples that could be collected. And what we have seen so far in the partnership that we have uh, fostered is that we are seeing some benefits that we can see uh, some of these infected animals being detected early and, and, and faster. So I think, again, that's the goal from a diagnostic standpoint is can we detect these animals early? So rather than being reactive when the animal dies, can we find them earlier in a herd and, 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 and have mitigation plan that we can reduce the infection? The other concept in these prion mediated diseases is that uh, they're driven by a certain uh, genetic or genotype. As we know uh, from another uh, prion mediated disease in sheep, uh, which is called scrapie, uh, we know what those genotypes are. We can breed for its resistance. Uh, the farmers have been doing that for the last 15 to 20 years, and we can breed for scrapie resistance. We do not know those markers in uh, deer yet. We know that there are certain markers that can delay the progression of the disease, but we don't know the markers that would completely eliminate the disease. So with our partners in other universities that have been working on these challenges, we've been te teaming up and coming up with what models could be used that could help mitigate the disease and the disease in the deer population. So thank you, I uh, really appreciate uh, the time. Thank you, Dr. Tawari. Uh, 
having uh, been part of uh, some of this conversation, uh, I know that you've put quite an effort into it. Uh, so uh, again, I want to encourage our viewers and listeners to uh, ask questions in Facebook. And as a matter of fact, we do have one. Uh, and I think uh, we'll start uh, with uh, uh, Secretary Redding. Uh, what are some of the successes the department has had with research? And uh, the, the question uh, circles around, th they're thinking about plum pox and what uh, we were able to do at the department as, as a success story there. Yeah, thank you, Fred, and it's a, it's a good question. You know, it's interesting um, that, that uh, uh, the uh, caller identified plum pox. Um, I had that at the top of the list. You know, I, I think it's one of those untold stories of just how important the uh, citizen science is here, uh, but also the research institutions through, uh, you know, Penn State University and particularly our uh, Fruit Research and Extension Center uh, as part of that uh, extension network uh, in Adams County. You know, back in 1999, uh, much like the spotted lanternfly today, you know, we were confronted with a plum pox virus the first time that it was identified uh, in North America. Uh, and it was here in Adams County. Uh, and at the time, uh, it, it really uh, was viewed as terminal. I mean, it was gonna be the end of the stone fruit, which which are plums and peaches, uh, you know, and years on uh, with the cooperation of growers and Penn State and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, we actually succeeded in uh, eliminating that plum pox virus from Pennsylvania. Uh, that is both a state story and a national story. Uh, that is just one example. You know, I look at the, the conservation work and water quality in the phosphorus index uh, work that's done at Penn State. You pick from the panel today, and, and Dr. Kapuchapudi has talked about Corizon. Uh, you, you could say the same thing with the high path avian influenza. So there is a really long list that I think everyone listening should know that uh, the, the funding that we support and provide through the state really acts as the yeast, right? It raises the other money, it raises the professional group, the, you know, all of the, uh, the disciplines that are that are come together to help solve these problems. But uh, from this, that there is a really long list of success stories over the years. But as anyone here will tell you, uh, you have to also start, you have to invest, you've got to work at it and be perse you know, persevere through that. So, uh, but a good story to tell in our investment in ag research. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Redding. So uh, a last question for the group, um, research, innovation, and advancement all go hand in hand. From your perspectives, what are the greatest challenges facing the agriculture and food industries? And how can the public provide support to combat these challenges through research? Um, Dr. Kuchipudi, would you uh, mind starting? Sure. Um, I think that's a really a great question. So as I uh, as I highlighted um, uh, during my presentation earlier, um, one of the major challenges that we face um, are the infectious diseases, both for animal agriculture and plant agriculture. And, and as Secretary Redding mentioned that uh, whatever the research we, we do in the Department of Agriculture, this is keeping in mind uh, the Commonwealth and the societal impact of this research. So, for example, if you focus on food safety and food security, so the emerging diseases do threaten uh, considerably the, the food uh, security um, and the animal agriculture. So from a public standpoint, I think it is critical to, to recognize that um, all the science and the research that we do uh, has a significant impact and, and public um, uh, health and the societal impact. Um, and and uh, uh, a couple of things that are more tangible and practical uh, are that the, the farming community or those that work with animals, for example, um, we have always been uh, highlighting the need and the recognition of uh, biosafety and biosecurity. So I think it is critical that the public uh, listen to science and, and get the information. And we are all in this together. So the research is is just one of the the multiple uh, multi pronged approach that we all are working together to protect our 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 society and the animal agriculture. So I think the key aspect is that the the public need to be aware of uh, some of these challenges, 
and to to know how uh, they can participate and uh, uh, and that includes specific ways of um, um, mitigating the transmission. So some of the diseases do transmit through people. So in order to um, play a role in this, uh, we need to listen to the science. And a, a one particular aspect is to understand what biosecurity actually means and how we can all implement this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuchipudi. Uh, and thank you all. Uh, your research continues to benefit farmers and consumers every day. And we cannot thank you enough for your contributions to science. Um, Secretary Redding, a uh, few parting words, please. Well, I was actually looking forward to the responses uh, on the challenges from you know, some of the other uh, panelists because it's uh, it's important. But uh, it maybe will be a moment to, to still do that. But just to say, you know, uh, I'll end where I began with with a simple thank you uh, as I listened to this morning's. Uh, presentations on some of those contemporary issues. Uh, it's a reminder of, you know, the uh, the assets. One of the great assets of this Commonwealth is our research institutions in Penn State and Penn and Temple and uh, you know, our, our friends at Rodale. Uh, is, is it really is a full partnership, and I, I value that. We value that in the department, um, but it's also a reminder. Uh, that the work that we're doing is is both a combination of science and civics, right? It's the science part of the work uh, we understand. Uh, it's the civics of both the inbound concerns that we have to address, but also how do we translate? How do we explain? How do we you know, express to the public that this work and investment that we're making is is uh, is addressing both immediate concerns, but it's also the quality of life uh, in this Commonwealth. Uh, and I think that's partly what uh, in this uh, series of Cultivating Tomorrow we wanted to express is that we do a lot of things in, uh, in, in agriculture, but we don't all often get a chance to sort of talk about how it translates and what does it actually mean. So to the researchers here and the work that you're doing, uh, thank you very much for helping us cultivate that tomorrow, uh, but at its very heart uh, is the work and research and uh, finding those solutions to really complex issues, right? I mean, any one of the topics today are really complicated uh, and, are, and are life's work for, uh, for the researchers, for institutions, because it's dynamic, right? Uh, a, a problem leads to a solution which further needs you know, further uh, development of uh, you know, how do you apply those in terms of commercial or management or the social aspects of, of our work? So uh, just a note of thanks again to all who are uh, in this uh, partnership with us. Uh, we're proud of the work. We're honored to be part of it. And, and thank you very much for what you're doing. And I guess uh, we do have a little bit more time, uh, Secretary. So, um, again, I'll, I'll put the question out to the group. Um, Again, from your perspectives, what are the greatest challenges facing the agriculture and food industries? And how can the public provide support to combat these challenges through research? Um, I, yeah, this is Tom Baker. I, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Deputy, Deputy Strathmire. I, um, I think the, from the entomological standpoint, um, big challenge is the urban agricultural interface that is coming up with solutions that not only help growers but that help um, the stakeholders uh, the citizens of, of pennsylvania for instance and we've been involved not only in the mushroom forward fly um, issue but also in the spotted lanternfly issue now, I would propose both of those are invasive species. So invasive species is another big challenge. The mushroom forward fly is an invasive species, not from another country, but it invades people's homes around the Philadelphia area. And the way we've had some, uh, really some breakthrough success with the uh, uh, new materials that are essential oil materials, is that we've um, benefited both the uh, mushroom farmers 
and the homeowner. So the agric agricultural urban interface. So I meant to say when I uh, spoke earlier in this session that the Shiraki Farms uh, growers were able to get a third and sometimes a fourth harvest from the same rooms, which is almost unprecedented, um, which is very economically beneficial for them. So usually they only get two harvests of mushrooms but uh, from each room. So in reducing the flies, we've helped the growers and we've started to help the uh, residents of these communities in, in the uh, area. So I, the innovation was seen very simple, is putting this material, this safe material in the windows on screens and the flies kill themselves by the hundreds and hundreds of thousands as they try to go in and out of those windows. So sometimes technology innovation seems very simple, but it can be very effective. And we need to, same thing with spotted lanternfly. We're working on some uh, very simple techniques to help try to control the uh, monitors of lanternfly uh, using some of the things we found out uh, that telephone poles, all vertical objects. But I'll stop there. It's the hardest thing for researchers to make things work in the field. That's the big challenge. You can do a lot in the lab, but to get things to work in the field and have a positive impact for farmers and residents, that's the proof in the pudding. Very hard to do. Sorry I rambled on, but uh, thank you. No, you're fine. Um, and I would just simply add uh, uh, your point about the community. Uh, I've seen this with uh, spotted lantern fly as well as the forward fly, the community interaction. So thank you very much. Dr. Parsons, do you have a couple parting words there? Sure. I, uh, here at PennVet, I think we just build out a little bit um, on this kind of uh, societal interaction piece. And I think we've been very, very interested in helping farmers over the years try to evolve uh, their methods and practices to meet this um, changing expectation society has about agriculture. And I see that to be one of the continuing uh, challenges that we face. And unfortunately, um, <clears throat> sometimes I think what is a well-intentioned uh, thoughts um, <clears throat> result in policy actually getting ahead of science. And I think one example I would throw out to you is this Proposition 12, which is going into effect in a year from now in uh, California that has the potential to impact um, farmers all over the country. Um, and in many cases, I'm stressing uh, kind of concerns about confinement agriculture. And like I say, um, they're well-intentioned, but really some of the solutions that are reached there in their policy aren't supported by science. And we've been lucky enough to get a very generous support from the uh, Center for Livestock and Poultry Excellence to try to help go back and fill in some of that science um, um, to try to hopefully kind of close the gaps and see if we can come up with workable solutions. Because um, if we get policy out ahead of science, then often you don't have the intended uh, consequences that you'd like to get. And it can be bad for the farmers and bad for the animals. And ultimately, they're going to be bad for the, uh, the consumers and the people that are driving these concerns. So I think in terms of what public can do to, to help that is one is try to be as informed as possible, um, but then also continue to support research in these areas. Because um, uh, often, as uh, I think Senator uh, as Secretary Redding mentioned, these are really complicated topics, and so often we know we know less than we know more, and, and so there's always a need for support in these areas. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. Dr. Tawar, you have a, we've got a couple minutes. Yes, thank you. So I think uh, the challenges there I see is having a uh, great partnership that would rely on public. Uh, private government all working together to come up with a solution that the public really at the end with the solution that is developed trusts. So building that trust that it's in the benefit of the the communities out there, I think that's the most critical. And Secretary Redding pointed out how we are able to communicate. I think that's the next important thing, communicating to have an efficient and effective solution uh, to build that trust 
that the communities can then rely upon and use that research that has been developed. Otherwise, those dollars may not go anywhere if that is uh, not implemented properly or not adopted properly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tawari. I think we've got a minute or two, uh, Mr. Moyer or Dr. Helmus. Yes, uh, thank you, Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary. I, I guess I'm going to try to be really brief, but I think the biggest problem that we challenge that we face in agriculture in Pennsylvania and across the country is this tremendous growth that we're seeing from the medical community to better link themselves with the agricultural community. And how is agriculture going to embrace that new drive as more and more hospitals, even Penn State Hershey Medical Center, St. Luke's Hospital, uh, so, uh, uh, the um, up in Danville there, uh, so many of our hospital systems are beginning to create pharmacies with an F instead of a PH. And how agriculture for a long time has worked hard to divorce itself from human health as we don't even see ourselves often as food producers, but as commodity growers. And we need to rethink that in agriculture. And I wonder how agriculture is going to embrace this huge growth area and change as we decide how we're going to embrace the medical community or not. Thank you, Mr. Moyer. Uh, just great, great thoughts, great observation. Um, we're about out of time. And I, again, I want to thank our panelists uh, for taking the time today. Uh, your insight has been uh, monumental. It's, uh, it's something that, uh, again, I know that uh, we as, as consumers, we as citizens of the state, we certainly uh, do look to you as the scientists to, to take us to the next step. So again, I want to thank, uh, thank everyone for, for joining us uh, during this uh, Cultivating Tomorrow discussion on innovation and celebrating Pennsylvania agriculture from home with us uh, during this virtual Pennsylvania Farm Show. Uh, if you'd like to, to see more of it, uh, visit uh, farmshow.pa.gov for the full schedule of events. Thank you again, everyone. Much appreciated. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Thank